All right, chapter 13, DUI traffic stops. Unit one, lesson one, effects on society and deterrence. DUI, the effects on society and deterrence. Impaired driving is a major cause of traffic fatalities in the United States. Everyone bears the cost of impaired driving. Property damage, financial burden, injury, and death are all parts of the cost. Impaired drivers are more likely to take excessive risks, have slow reaction times, and are less likely to like, less likely to wear seatbelts. So again, everyone bears the cost of impaired driving. And there are three things uh, that impaired drivers are more likely to do. One, take excessive risks, have slow reaction times, and less likely to wear seatbelts. Driving under the influence, DUI, is both a societal and a law enforcement problem. So it's both the community and law enforcement. Education is an essential part of preventing impaired driving. Deterrence is another major part of the solution. So education and deterrence are the two major parts of preventing impaired driving. Successful DUI deterrence includes increased enforcement activity and identifying the cues and clues of impairment. One of the primary tools you'll use during a DUI investigation are the SFSTs, which are the standardized field sobriety tests. These are three accurate and reliable tests to determine alcohol or drug impairment. Uh, Lesson two, alcohol in the human body. Alcohol is a central nervous system depressant. It is among the most commonly abused substance in the United States. Absorption is the process by which alcohol enters the bloodstream. Distribution is the process by which the bloodstream carries alcohol to the body's tissues and organs. Metabolism is the process by which the body breaks down alcohol for elimination. And elimination is the process by which the body expels alcohol through exhaled breath, sweat, tears, saliva, and urine. So think of absorption as entering the bloodstream. Distribution is alcohol being carried through the bloodstream. Metabolism is the body breaking down alcohol. And elimination is the body expelling alcohol. And with elimination, there are four ways to eliminate alcohol from your body. Exhaled breath, sweat, tears, saliva, and urine. That's five things. Any amount of alcohol can affect a person's ability to drive. The degree to which alcohol affects a person depends on how much alcohol they consume, the length of time over which they consume it, the individual physiologically and physical size of the person, and whether the person has eaten any food. Common effects of alcohol on a person's mental and physical faculties may include slowed reaction and perception reaction time, so PRT, perception reaction time, poor judgment, taking risks, and poor coordination. Now we move to the chart of common symptoms of alcohol influence based on the BAC, blood alcohol concentration. 0.03% to 0.059%, you have issues with concentration. 0.06% to 0.09%, you have issues with depth perception and peripheral vision. Then from 0.1% to 0.19%, you have reflexes, PRT, which is perception reaction time, speech and staggering. Then you have 0.2% to 0.29%, which is severe motor impairment, passing out, and memory loss. So just remember that um, pre-0.85, 0.085, you have issues with concentration. Then between the 0.6 and 0.9, which is around the 0.85 legal limit, you have depth, perception, and peripheral vision issues. Then we move on to uh, drug categories. Uh, Controlled substances are defined in Chapter 893 of the Florida Statutes. Drugs that impair drivers fall into seven major categories based on the observable signs and symptoms the drugs produce. So again, that's seven categories. The first one is central nervous system depressants, such as alcohol, antidepressants, and barbiturates. barbiturates. Then number two, you have central nervous system stimulants. These are uh, amphetamines and cocaine. Then you have three, which are hallucinogens, such as ecstasy, LSD, and cyclobin. Then for four, we have disassociative anesthetics, PCP and ketamine. And then for number five, we have narcotic analgesics, which is heroin, morphine, and opium. Shout out to Hao for telling me how to pronounce that. Analgesics. Then number six, we have inhalants, such as aerosols and paint thinners. And then number seven, uh, cannabis, marijuana, and medical marijuana. Then we move on to polydrug use. 
you may encounter drivers who are impaired by poly drug use. Poly drug use is using drugs from two or more drug categories at the same time. Examples include drinking alcohol while smoking marijuana or taking pain medication, sprinkling PCP on marijuana joints, or combining heroin with cocaine. These combinations often increase impairment. And then know what unintentional impairment is, and this can occur when a person combines alcohol with prescription medication. So this is um, pretty important here as unintentional impairment because you might take your normal prescription medication such as blood pressure medicine, um, even ibuprofen, and not realize that you took it and then go ahead and drink alcohol and now you're unintentionally impairing yourself more than normal. Then we have medical marijuana. Uh, Section 381 of the Florida Statutes permits the medical use of marijuana by qualified patients with specific medical conditions. A qualified patient or the qualified patient's caregiver must be in immediate possession of a medical marijuana use registry, which is a murmur, identification card, when in possession of marijuana or a marijuana delivery device. During a traffic stop, they must provide the card to you upon request. So kind of like a driver with um, their license, you have to provide that marijuana card upon request. And then possession of the card does not relieve a person from any requirement under law to submit to a urine or blood test or other test to detect the presence of a controlled or chemical substance. So basically meaning just because you have a um, medical marijuana card does not mean you still can't get tested just like the average person can for urine, blood, or um, any type of test like that. Then we move on to medical conditions that mimic impairment. Some medical conditions that may produce abnormal behavior include epilepsy, diabetes, head injury, or cognitive problems, dementia, or Alzheimer's. I'm not going to go too much deep into that because we got that through uh, first aid and every other chapter. Uh, lesson three, legal issues. Uh, Florida State Statute 316, which is a statute we've been going through lately. Uh, this is a person that is driving under the influence, uh, DUI. If they are driving or in actual physical control of a vehicle while impaired by alcohol or certain chemical or controlled substances to the extent that the person's normal faculties are impaired. So that is driving under the influence. Um, you're driving with physical control of the vehicle with some sort of chemical controlled substance or alcohol that impairs your normal faculties. Uh, normal faculties are defined as a person's ability to see, hear, walk, talk, judge, dis judge distances, drive an automobile, make judgments, act in emergencies, and normally perform, perform the mental and physical acts of daily life. So think of normal faculties as basically every normal function that you have. Then a person is in actual physical control of a vehicle if the person is physically in or on the vehicle and has the capability to operate that vehicle, regardless of whether the person is actually operating the vehicle at the time. So actual physical control, um, you don't have to be currently act or, uh, operating the vehicle, you just have to have the ability to start operating that vehicle. So for example, having the keys in your pocket and standing outside the car could be um, having the actual physical control and the, uh, the availability to operate that vehicle. So physically in or on the vehicle. Uh, a person can be arrested and prosecuted for a DUI even if they are not actually driving. For example, a person who is asleep or passed out in the front seat of a vehicle with the key in their possession is in actual physical control of the vehicle and is subject to arrest. So question comes up on the test, a scenario where they're saying they're sleeping in the car, they have their keys on them, the car is either on or off at that point, would this be considered actual physical control? And it would be. Now, but if they say that the person's sleeping in the car and the keys are thrown 30 feet from the vehicle, that would not be actual physical control because they can't just turn on the car and start driving. Um, then we move on to, you can arrest the person for DUI on any road or public or private property within the state of Florida. You can also arrest a person for DUI even if the person is driving a vehicle other than a motor vehicle, such as a bicycle, golf cart, or ATV. The Florida statutes establish a legal presumption based on the driver's blood or breath alcohol level. If the driver's alcohol concentration was 0 .08 or higher, a jury is to presume that the driver was under the influence of alcohol to the extent that the normal faculties were impaired. So when we come to 0 .08, remember that this is a legal presumption that as soon as they hit that marker, they are automatically impaired based on their normal faculties, kind of no matter what. That's kind of a catch-all as long as they're 0 .08 or higher, automatically impaired. You don't have to sit there and debate whether or not the person was impaired. The state determines that they are impaired at that point. 
Then again, under 316 of Florida statutes, states that evidence of a blood or breath alcohol level greater than 0.05 but less than 0.08 does not necessarily mean that the driver was under the influence of alcohol to the extent that the normal faculties were impaired. So there's no presumption when it's between 0.08 and less than 0.0. Um, when it's greater than 0.05 but less than 0.08, there's no presumption that they're impaired. But you, if you consider other evidence and the totality of circumstances, then you could still write them a DUI and say that they were impaired. So point, over 0 0.08, 0 0.08 or higher automatically means that they're impaired. And then between 0 0.05 and less than 0 0.08, you would need other types of evidence to conclude that they are impaired. However, a jury may consider the alcohol concentration with other competent evidence, such as the driver's driving pattern, the officer's personal contact with the driver, and the SFSTs. Um, to determine whether they were under the influence of alcohol enough that their normal faculties were impaired. And remember with SFSTs, again, that is... God, where are those? To do SFSTs stand for Standardized Field Sobriety Tests. Then we come under Miranda warnings. Miranda warnings are not required before you administer the standardized field tests. And... Um, However, when determining whether to advise of a Miranda warning during a DUI investigation, follow your agency policies and procedures. And again, SFSD, we're going to get that down as a standardized field sobriety test. So again, Miranda warnings are not required before you administer those standardized tests. Um, and the previous part of pulling someone over to begin with would be a traffic stop. That would not need a Miranda warning either. Um, so basically, no Miranda warnings, you don't need to do that. Then we move on to implied consent. Again, Florida Statutes 316 state that under implied consent, if an officer lawfully arrests a driver for driving or being in actual physical control of a motor vehicle while under the influence, the driver must submit to an approved chemical or physical test to determine the alcohol content of the presence of a chemical or controlled substance in their breath, urine, or blood. Implied consent should not stop the officer from explaining their actions to the driver. So again... Remember, uh, Florida Statute 316, that seems to be the recurring theme here. Uh, and again, with implied consent, if an officer lawfully arrests a driver, basically if an officer arrests somebody lawfully, they have to submit to a chemical or um, some sort of test for alcohol, for chemicals, or abuse substances, um, whether it's blood, urine, or breath, they have to submit based on implied consent. Now, if it is not a motor vehicle, the driver is not subject to implied consent. However, a person younger than 21 is subject to an implied consent for determining blood alcohol content. All right. Then we have a refusal affidavit. If a driver refuses to submit to a breath, urine, or blood test after the implied consent warning, complete a refusal affidavit along with a DUI citation. So that uh, implied consent warning is where they basically say, I'm requesting this, this blood or urine or breath test. You know, will you take it? Yes or no. If you say no, then the first refusal is 12 months. And then if it happens to be their second refusal, then your license is suspended for 18 months. And then remember, um, it becomes a misdemeanor um, later on. I think the third attempt, it becomes a misdemeanor which is criminal. Do, do, do. Not seeing that here. Okay, so if they refuse and they have to sign the refusal affidavit and you give them a DUI citation. Then we have a commercial motor vehicle DUI. A person who has any alcohol in their body may not drive or be in actual physical control of a commercial vehicle in the state of Florida. So if you have any alcohol at all in your body, you cannot be in physical control or driving a commercial motor vehicle. Now, uh, this penalty applies if the driver refuses to submit to a breath, urine, or blood test to determine alcohol concentration, or if the driver is driving a commercial motor vehicle with an alcohol concentration of 0 0.04 or greater. So basically what it's saying here is if you arrest the driver for DUI while operating or an actual physical control of a motor vehicle, the driver may lose their commercial driver's license for one year subject to administrative hearing and then if it happens a second time they automatically lose their license and <clears throat> this penalty applies like i said if the driver refuses to submit or the alcohol concentration um, of the driver is 0 0.04 or higher so just remember with commercial vehicles it is 0 0.04 
um, or higher is the issue with commercial motor vehicles and um, you automatically lose your license for a year and then the second time you lose it altogether. Uh, then we move on to drivers younger than 21, the point zero two violation. It is unlawful for a person younger than 21 who has a blood alcohol level of a breath or breath alcohol level of 0.02 or higher to drive or be in actual physical control of a motor vehicle because they shouldn't be drinking in the first place. Um, if you do, conduct a DUI investigation. And um, if the subject is not arrested for DUI, proceed with the 0.02 investigation based on the odor or alcohol of their breath. So an option for under 21 is to not arrest for DUI, but to go ahead with a 0.02 investigation. Uh, they need to submit a breath test, and if the driver refuses to submit to a breath test, read the implied consent for the .02 violation, and if they still refuse, issue a notice of license suspension for the .02 violation. So the .02 violation is not criminal, they just take away their license. Then we move on to lesson four, note-taking guidelines. Taking notes is one of the most important tasks in a DUI investigation, keep that in mind. The evidence you observe and document is largely sensory, such as sight, smell, and hearing in nature and is extremely short-lived. So that's why you need to make sure to take thorough notes throughout the DUI process. Then move on to Unit 2, Lesson 1, DUI Detection Process. Uh, DUI Detection Process. This process begins when you first suspect that a driver may be impaired and ends when you determine that there is or is not sufficient probable cause to arrest the person for DUI offense. So the detection process, as soon as you notice maybe um, the car swerving and you're thinking that they're impaired, or maybe you walk up to them on another traffic offense, but you walk up and you smell the alcohol, they're slurred their speech, that would begin the DUI detection process. And the DUI detection process would end when you realize, okay, they're clearly not drunk, maybe it's diabetes, maybe it's something else, or there's probable cause, they are drunk, I'm arresting them, that would then end the DUI detection process. The DUI investigation involves three phases of detection. Phase one, which is vehicle in motion, observing the way the driver operates and stops the vehicle. Phase two, personal contact, observing and speaking with the driver face to face. Phase three, pre-arrest screening, administering the SFST, the standardized field sobriety test to the driver to determine if there is probable cause for arrest for DUI. So again, phase one, vehicle motion, phase two, personal contact, and phase three, the pre-arrest screening, which would be this um, field sobriety test. The DUI detection process do not, does not always include all three phases. So for example, the driver's passed out behind the wheel of the vehicle, that is not in motion, so you're not getting the vehicle in motion part. Um, you arrive at the scene of a traffic crash, which means you didn't observe phase one, the vehicle in motion, or it's a request for motorist assistance. <clears throat> you show up, their vehicle is already stopped, you're not seeing the vehicle in motion. Sometimes you are unable to conduct the SFSTs on the driver. For example, when the driver is physically unable to perform the tests or they're transported to the hospital or they refuse to submit the field sobriety tests. Unit two, lesson two, uh, we're talking about vehicle in motion here. Based on your observations, decide if there is reasonable suspicion to instruct the driver to stop and make sure to ask yourself these two questions. What is the vehicle doing? And do I have reason to stop the vehicle? So again, before you're stopping a vehicle for DUI, you need to have some sort of reasonable suspicion, whether it be um, some sort of traffic violation or you have reasonable suspicion to assume they're driving because of their impaired driving. Um, you need to make sure you have that pretext stop legality to it. Uh, take note of any additional cues of a possible DUI violation. A cue, C-U-E, is a reminder, prompt, or a signal to do something, such as take law enforcement action or observe the vehicle more closely. Now we're talking about DUI cues. Uh, these may indicate that there is impairment, a vehicle problem, or a medical emergency. Below are some of the vis visual cues that may indicate an impaired driver. Uh, you have four of them. You have lane position, speed and braking problems, vigilance problems, and judgment problems. So we're gonna start with lane position. This would be weaving, weaving across the lanes, drifting, straddling a line, swerving, almost striking an object or vehicle, or turning with a wide radius. Then you have speed and braking problems. Uh, stopping problems, they stop too far, too short, too jerky. Accelerating or decelerating unnecessarily. Uh, varying speed, driving 10 miles per hour or more under the speed limit. Then you have vigilance problems, driving without headlights at night, failing to signal, driving in opposing lanes or the wrong way on, the, on a one-way road, responding slowly to traffic signals, failing to respond, to an officer signals or stopping in the lane for no apparent reason. 
Then you have judgment problems following too closely, such as tailgating, conducting an improper or unsafe lane change, making an illegal or improper turn, driving off the roadway, stopping inappropriately in response to an officer, or appearing to be impaired. Then we have a DUI motorcyclist visual cues. These are all basically the same. Going the wrong way, following too closely, weaving, uh, problems dismounting, issues with balance, uh, drifting, things like that. Then we have a vehicle stop. After directing the driver to stop the vehicle, the impaired driver may show additional evidence of DUI, such as attempting to flee, not responding, responding slowly, swerving abruptly, stopping suddenly, striking the curb or another object. Uh, please excuse that thunder is crazy tonight. Uh, then we have divided attention. This is the ability to concentrate or, on two or more tasks at the same time. And a driver's ability to divide attention is, um, is impaired. So somebody that is impaired does not have the ability to have divided attention. Once the driver stops the vehicle, do not ask them to move their vehicle to a safer location because, again, if they are driving while drinking, you don't want them driving any more than they need to. And again, to reemphasize divided attention, this is the ability to concentrate on two or more tasks at the same time. Divided attention. All right, unit two, lesson three. Uh, we move on to phase two, which is personal contact. Phase two has two major evidence gathering tasks and one major decision. Task one would be observe and talk with the driver in the vehicle. Task two, observe the driver exiting the vehicle. So uh, again, phase two is personal contact. This is um, talking with the driver and this is observing them actually exiting the vehicle. Based on these observations, you have to make a major decision. Administer this, uh, the field sobriety test, continue dialoguing with the driver while looking for additional evidence, or you finish the contact if you do not observe any impairment. Phase one may not be possible, so you may move on to phase two. Uh, during a DUI investigation, a clue, C-L-U-E, is a piece of evidence that suggests impairment. Clues are also the behaviors observed during the performance of the field sobriety test. Some observable signs of impairment include bloodshot eyes, soiled clothing, alcohol containers, drugs, or drug paraphernalia, odor of alcoholic beverages or marijuana smoke, cover-up odors like breath spray or tobacco smoke, or fumbling with a driver's license or paperwork or with motor vehicle controls. An impaired driver may be slow to respond, ask you to repeat questions, repeat your questions or comments, provide incorrect information, change answers, slur their speech, admit to drinking, provide inconsistent responses, or use abusive language. Once reasonable suspicion is evident, ask the driver to exit the vehicle. If there is not reasonable suspicion, you must let them go. So if this comes up on the test and it says you pull over the driver and or maybe you pull them over for something else like a broken taillight, you come up and you might suspect the UI. Uh, but you're not able to develop actual reasonable suspicion, you must let them go. Um, if it is evident, then you ask them to then exit the vehicle. As the driver exits, observe their behaviors, look for clues, such as if the driver cannot follow instructions, cannot open the door, leaves the vehicle in gear or climbs out of the vehicle, sways or staggers while walking, leans against the vehicle or another object, or places hands on the vehicle for balance. Um, at this point in the DUI detection process, the officer will make the decision whether or not to proceed to phase three. Then we move on to phase three, which is pre-arrest screening, which are the field sobriety tests. Phase three of the DUI investigation is the pre-arrest screening process, which is administering, again, the standardized field sobriety test. The standardized field sobriety test consists of, consists of the horizontal gaze and astigmas test and two psychophysical tests, walk and turn and the one leg stand. So again, SFSTs consist of the horizontal gaze and astigmas and two psychophysical tests, such as the walk and turn and the one leg stand. The horizontal gaze nystigmus, which is the HGN, is an involuntary jerking that occurs as the eyes move towards the side. A psychophysical test is a divided attention test that measures a person's ability to perform both mental and physical tasks at the same time. So with the psychophysical test, you're, you're working on divided attention for mental and physical tasks. And then the HGN is the horizontal gaze nystigmus. And these three tests, two psychophysical and one HGN um, is what the SFSTs consist of. If you change any of the field sobriety test elements, you may compromise the reliability of the test. Again, these are standardized, so you cannot change anything. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, NHTSA, published studies that validated the standardized field sobriety test for use across the country. So again, that's the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, and they're the one who published the studies that validated these tests. 
make sure when you're doing these tests, you select um, a safe location and obviously a level ground. Then we're moving on to horizontal gaze nystigmus. Uh, nystigmus is a involuntary jerking of the eyes. Resting nystigmus is the jerking of the eyes as the eyes look straight ahead. So obviously the eyes are resting straight ahead. That would be resting nystigmus. Um, this condition, when you have resting nystigmus, uh, though not frequently seen, usually indicates a pathological disorder or high doses of a drug such as PCP. So if their eyes are just straight ahead and they're jerking involuntarily, um, that's high doses of a drug and, or a pathological disorder, and that is resting nystigmus. Uh, with HGN uh, testing, HGN is horizontal uh, nystigmus. Uh, you're going to give these following instructions. So you're going to say, I'm going to check your eyes. Do you wear glasses or contacts? If they're wearing glasses, ask them to remove their glasses. Then step two, stand with your feet together, heels and toes, and your hands down at your side. The subject may also be seated. Step three, keep your head still and follow this object with your eyes slowly and only. And four, do not move your head. Step five, do you understand the instructions? Position the object about 12 to 15 inches from the driver's nose and slightly above their eye level. The object can be, you know, the tip of a pen, the eraser on a pencil, a fingertip, um, things like that. Begin with the driver's left eye, then the right, and examine each eye twice. How you remember that? Um, with information, we always have to do every first step with our left foot. So um, transition that over to here where whenever you begin with any of these field tests, you're going to always begin with the left. That's both with the walking one and with the horizontal nystigmus, the vertical nystigmus, and... Um, the onset of nystigmus prior to 45, those all start with the left first. So keep that in mind. And you're always gonna examine each eye twice in all of these. Um, here are some things with checking this. Um, make sure you know what equal tracking is. This is the ability of the eyes to track together as they follow an object. If the eyes do not track together, it could indicate a possible medical disorder, injury, or blindness. If you observe unequal pupil size, it could indicate a possible medical injury or disorder. So again, if they don't track together, it's a mental disorder, um, injury, or blindness. It doesn't have to do with alcohol. And then if you observe the unequal pupil size, that would be a medical disorder or injury as well, um, not alcohol related. Then we're looking for the lack of smooth pursuit. And this occurs when the eye of an impaired driver jerks or bounces as the eye follows a smoothly moving stimulus. So again, um, normally if you look from side to side, your eyes just flow very smoothly. Um, but if the person is um, very drunk or impaired, then the eyes will bounce and they won't just transition to the right or the left smoothly. They'll bounce from whether item to item or they'll stop and then move and stop and then move, kind of jerky or bouncing. Uh, move the stimulus smoothly at a speed that requires approximately two seconds to bring the driver's eye as far as the side as it will go. So you're moving that pen or whatever you're using um, about two seconds to get all the way to the other side and you're doing it smoothly. You're not jerking or anything like that because you want to see if their eyes have that smooth pursuit. And again, lack of smooth pursuit is a definition here. And this is when the eye of an impaired driver jerks or bounces as the eye follows this um, smooth stimulus. Then you have the distinct and sustained nystigmus at maximum deviation. This is also a definition. Distinct and sustained nystigmus at maximum deviation. Um, this clue occurs when the gaze of the eye has moved as far as it can go towards the shoulder and no white is visible at the outside of the eye. So distinct and sustained astigmas is when your eye is, let's just say if you're looking straight ahead and you look all the way to your left, your left eye is um, the pupil and the cornea surrounding it is going to be all the way to the left. So there's not going to be any white. It's just going to be your eyeball there. That would be distinct and sustained astigmas at maximum deviation. Uh, you can observe the eye jerk when it is held at maximum deviation for a minimum of four seconds. When impaired by alcohol, the jerking will be more pronounced, sustained for more than four seconds, and easily observable. So basically what it's saying here, it's normal when you're at that maximum deviation for your eye to jerk, for a normal person not impaired. But if their jerking is more pronounced and that jerking lasts for more than four seconds and it's easily observable, then that would be a clue to... Um, an impaired driver. So yeah, some people exhibit slight jerking of the eye at maximum deviation, even when unimpaired. But again, it's going to be more pronounced. It's going to be sustained for more than four seconds, and it's going to be easily observable. So then you have the onset of nystigmus prior to 45 clue. If the point at which you see 
you first see the eye jerking begins before 45, it is possible that the driver has an alcohol concentration above 0.08 or has taken drugs. So again, let me compare that real quick. So you got maximum deviation, distinct and sustained and sustained at maximum deviation. That was with your eye looking as far as it can to the left or far as it can to the right. Then you have nystigmus prior to 45. So if you're looking straight ahead and then you have all the way far to the right, in between straight ahead and far to the right is 45 degrees on both sides. So that is prior to 45. So if you start trailing your pen and you're at zero degrees, which is right at your nose, and you start moving left, let's just say you get to 15 degrees, 30 degrees, and all of a sudden their eye starts jerking because you're not even at the 45 yet. And think of 90 all the way to the side of your face, 45 being in the middle, um, and then zero being where your nose is. So if you're coming up on the middle of their eye, coming around to 45 degrees, and their eyes start jerking with that nystigmus, then that means their concentration is probably way above 0 0.08 or they've taken drugs at this point. Uh, because again, an impaired person can, should get all the way to 90 degrees, all the way to the side of their face, and then it starts jerking. Um, but if they're already jerking halfway to that point, then that's a clue that they're way over 0 0.08 or they've taken drugs. Or they've taken drugs. Then you have vertical gaze and nystigmus. Uh, this is the involuntary jerking of the eyes as they move upward and are held at maximum de deviation for a minimum of four seconds. So just remember that with the vertical gaze and nystigmus, that is actually not part of the field sobriety test, but it is like an extra indicator to use to maybe even like support your DUI um, more. So again, VGN is the vertical gaze and nystigmus. This is when you're moving your eyes up and down. Um, so at your maximum point of looking up, you'll start having that nystigmus of your eyes jerking. Um, if the VGN is present and the HGN is not, it could be medical condition. So basically, if you're doing the horizontal version back and forth and your eyes aren't jerking crazy, but then you do up and down vertical, that means you have a medical condition. So something's really wrong with you. Um, again, like I said, vertical gaze and stigmas uh, was not included in the standardized field sobriety test in the original research. However, it is a reliable indicator of a high dose of alcohol for that individual and can also be caused by certain drugs. So like I said, if you want to kind of throw the vertical one in there when you're doing a DUI, this would just be a reliable indicator for extra high doses of alcohol and potentially other types of drugs. Then we have the maximum number of clues that may appear in one eye is three. The maximum number of total clues observed between both eyes is obviously two times three, six. So you have um, six clues, and I'll give them to you now, and they're in three groups. So the first two are lack of smooth pursuit, which is the right eye and the left eye, so two. Um, and remember, smooth pursuit is, that is, a, you know, remember we talked about the lack of smooth pursuit is when you're going back and forth with the pen across their eyes and they're supposed to follow it smoothly with their eyes don't jerk. So if both eyes do it, that's two clues right there, right? And remember, you only need four. I'll get into that in a minute. But the first two are lack of smooth pursuit for the left eye and then lack of smooth pursuit for the right eye. Then your next two are the distinct and sustained nystigmus at maximum deviation, left eye and right eye. So remember that. Um, so remember that the distinct and sustained nystigmus at maximum deviation is when. Um, so the smooth pursuit is just the, the tracing back and forth, following smoothly. But then the distinct and sustained nystigmus is when you you force them to look all the way to one side or the other, and you hold it there for four seconds. If they start jerking more than normal and this, this, and that, then that would be two more clues for the left eye and the right eye. And then you move to onset of nystigmus before 45, which is the last one we discussed here for both right eye and left eye, so that would be two more. That's where you're moving it, like I said, halfway between the maximum deviation and the middle point, which would be 45 degrees, it starts jerking even more, the left eye and the right eye. That would be six clues in total. The indications of impairment build upon each other. So this means that if you do not have lack of smooth pursuit, those are the first two clues, you will not have distinct and sustained nystigmus at maximum deviation. So that basically means that, remember, the lack of smooth pursuit is just the ability for your eyes to track. Remember the eye tracking? Um, when they track together, if, if their eyeballs are smoothly tracking that pen back and forth with no jerking motion, then you're not gonna have the maximum deviation um, sustained nystigmus. So basically saying that if you don't get the first two, you're not getting the next four. But if you do get the next two, um, then you could then possibly get the next four, but that also depends. So 
based on the research, if you observe four or more clues, it is likely that the driver's alcohol concentration is above 0.08. Using this criteria, you should be able to classify about 88% of drivers accurately. So remember, you need the lack of smooth pursuit first. Then if those clues end up coming about, you might be able to get the distinct and the stained nystigmus at maximum deviation. And if you get those, then you might be able to get the onset of nystigmus before 45 degrees. Examples of conditions that may interfere with the driver's performance of the horizontal nystigmus test include wind or dust irritating the eyes or visual or the distraction. So the test says, you know, what would interfere with this? It would obviously be dust and wind irritating someone's eyes. Um, and again, if you get four or more, you should be able to classify 88% of drivers accurately as being impaired. Okay, then we move on to the walk and turn test. So make sure obviously to do it in a stable level place. It's not slippery. Um, the walk and turn test consists of two stages, the instruction stage and the walking stage. So with both of these and you know the one with the one leg stand, they're kind of the same where the first stage is instruction stage and the second stage is actually doing it. So again, instruction stage and walking stage. In the instruction stage, you will tell the driver how to position themselves before walking and have them demonstrate the position. So you're gonna give them instructions and here are the instructions. Step one, place your left foot on a line. It could be a real line or an imaginary line. Step two, place your right foot on the line ahead in front of your left foot with the heel of your right foot against the toe of your left foot. Step three, place your arms down at your sides. Step four, maintain this position until I have completed the instructions. Do not start to walk until told to do so. Step five, do you understand the instructions so far and make sure the driver indicates that they understand. The instruction stage divides the driver's attention between a balancing tasks, standing with toes facing forward while maintaining the heel to toe position and an information processing task. So while you're giving the instructions, the person is obviously balancing because they have their foot in front of the other and they also have to be processing everything you're saying. Um, during this uh, during this stage, which is the instru instruction stage, there are two clues you can potentially get. One, the driver cannot keep balance during the instructions. So you're sitting there telling them the instructions, and their feet are, you know, they're falling over. Um, they're using their they're sticking out their arms to balance. Those are the two. Um, so you can get a clue from that one, or you can get a clue from the driver starts walking too soon. Remember, this is just the instruction stage. So you're telling them what they're going to do. If they just start walking all of a sudden, when you didn't tell them to go that would then be a clue that they're impaired because um, you didn't tell them to go yet and they're not listening. Uh, they're not able to function. They're not able to do that divided attention. Then we have uh, the second stage, which is a walking stage. In the walking stage, you tell the driver how to walk to complete the test and actually have them walk. And you're supposed to give them instructions. There are eight of them. I'll start with the first one. When I tell you to start, take nine heel-to-toe steps on the line, turn, and take nine heel-to-toe steps back. And you're going to demonstrate a minimum of three heel to toe steps for them. Step two, when you turn, keep your front foot on the line and turn by taking a series of small steps with the other foot like this. You're going to show them how to do it. While you are walking, keep your arms at your sides. Watch your feet at all times and count your steps out loud. When I tell you to begin, take nine heel to toe steps down the line. On the ninth step, keep your forward front foot on the line and take a series of small steps to turn around. Return nine heel toe steps back down the line. You're going to demonstrate them for this. While walking, watch your feet at all times. Keep your arms at your side and count your steps out loud. Once you begin, do not stop until the exercise is completed. Step six, do you have any physical injuries or limitations that would keep you from completing this test? If the answer is yes, move on to the next test and record their answer in your notes. Step seven, do you understand the instructions? Make sure that they indicate so. Step eight, begin and count your first step from the heel to toe position as one. And then they would go at that point. At the end of the test, examine each clue and record only, and only record each clue once. So remember, you can only record each clue once. So if a clue would be the person um, sticking their arms out to balance themselves, you're only going to record that they did that clue once. But you can um, record um, each clue multiple times. So the maximum number of clues observed for any driver is eight. However, you can observe each clue multiple times. So. When you go to record that they raise their arms, you can only say that they raise their arms that one time, but you can sit there and observe them hitting that clue multiple times. So if they raise their arms eight times, you can't say, oh, I got eight clues. You can say you got one clue, but you observe them failing that one clue eight times. Um, look for the following clues. Uh, the first clue would be they stop walking all of a sudden. The second clue would be they, misses their, they miss the heel to toe. 
So if the driver leaves a space of more than half an inch between the heel and toe of any of the steps, that would be a clue. They step off the line. Um, if the driver places one foot entirely off the line, um, so if they're partly on the line, obviously that's fine. Uh, the fourth clue would be they use their arms for balance. Um, if they raise one or both arms more than six inches from the side. Uh, the fifth clue would be improper turn. If the driver removes the front foot from the line while returning. If the driver has not followed in directions as demonstrated, spins or pivots around or loses balance while turning. Six, incorrect number of steps. If the driver takes anything other than nine steps in either direction. Based on this research, if you observe two or more clues, it is likely that the driver's alcohol concentration is above 0.08. Using this criteria, you should be able to classify about 79% of drivers accurately. So again, the max amount of clues are eight with the walking in a straight line, um, and you only need to observe two or more clues to get 79% um, of drivers accurately being at 0 0.08 or higher. If the driver is unable to safely complete the test, you may stop the test early and make sure to document the reason uh, the test was stopped. Then we have the one-legged stand. The one-leg stand test consists of two stages. Again, like I said, you have the instruction stage, which both of them have, and then the second stage, which is the balance and counting stage. So that's what you're doing with this one, balance and counting. Uh, make sure to give instructions and demonstrate from a safe position from the driver. Um, the two instructions are stand with your feet together and your arms at your side. The second instruction is maintain this position until told otherwise. The instruction stage divides the driver's attention again between a balancing task, which is putting your feet together and your arms down, and an information processing task you're listening to and you remember the instructions. Then we move on to the second stage, which is balance and counting stage. Um, these are the instructions. First instruction, when I tell you to do so, raise one leg, either one, about six inches off the ground. Foot pointed out, parallel to the ground, both legs straight, and look at the elevated foot. Count aloud in the following manner, 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, and so on until I tell you to stop. Do you understand the instructions? Make sure the driver gives you verbal confirmation that they understand, and then begin the test. Time the one-legged stand for 30 seconds with the time measuring device, and note which leg the driver lifts. The maximum number of clues observed for any driver is four. However, you can observe each clue multiple times. So with the lifting your leg, um, think about it as four maximum clues, where the walking one is eight maximum clues. And how you can kind of remember this is uh, that the walking one, it takes twice as long to do. It's twice as complicated. So you're having twice the amount of clues, which is eight clues. And then for the opposite, when it comes to the standing on one leg, it's half the amount of work, half the amount of time. So half the amount of clues, four clues. Um, you can look for these clues. One clue would be a uh, sway when you're balancing. Record this clue in your notes if the driver sways in any direction while balancing. Uh, they use their arm to balance. Record if the driver raises their arm six or more inches to maintain balance. Um, if they hop, record if the driver hops to maintain balance. Um, and four, if they put their foot down. Record if the driver puts their foot down one or more times. And record if the driver puts their foot down during the 30 second count and record the account number when it happens. So if it happens at 25 seconds, you would say at 25 seconds they put their foot down. Based on the research, if you observe two or more clues, it is likely that the driver's alcohol concentration is above 0 0.08. Using this criteria, you should be able to classify about 83% of drivers accurately. I don't know if this test is going to be asking us about the percentages. If they do, that's pretty fucked up because there's 83% here and on the balancing one, and then there's 79% on the walking one, and then... Uh, there was a percentage on another one, 88% on the on the horizontal gaze one. That was 88%. And then and there might be another couple of percentages that I can't find at this moment. 91% um, for the SFFTs overall, in general. Anyway, then we move on to law enforcement action procedures for DUI crashes when conducting a DUI crash investigation identify a wheel witness we obviously know what that is that is someone who can place the driver in actual physical control of the vehicle at the time of the crash and who can provide a statement or of, of observations of the crash and the driver uh, make sure when it comes to decision to arrest if probable cause does not exist do not arrest so let them go that comes up in the test no probable cause no arrest just like any other crime many DUI offenses are misdemeanor crimes However, there are times when the offense is a felony, such as in the event of a serious bodily injury, death, or multiple prior convictions, and then DUI becomes a felony. Post-arrest evidence. 
After the arrest, you will attempt to collect breath, urine, or blood tests. If the driver refuses to take the test, fill out the refusal affidavit as explained earlier. Uh, breath tests. A certified breath test operator, BTO, breath test operator, is required to administer the breath test on an arrested driver following agency policies and procedures. You may not use a portable breath test device to determine probable cause for DUI arrest. So again, no portable devices. After DUI arrest, a certified BTO, BTO again says breath stands for breath test operator, or a designee assigned by the BTO monitors the driver face to face. The observation must be for a continuous 20 minutes. If the results of the breath test indicate an alcohol concentration of 0.08 or higher, complete a DUI citation. If the results of the breath test indicate an alcohol concentration below 0.08, then you complete a UTC for the charge of DUI based on probable cause for the arrest. So basically, if it's below 0.08, remember, but above 0.05, you can still make the arrest. You still have the probable cause to make the arrest, which is what you did. And that would be based on, you know, obviously the totality of the circumstances at that point. If the driver refuses to submit to the breath test, you still complete a DUI citation and you mark the box for refusal. To request a breath sample, the subject must be under physical arrest. So again, when it comes to breath um, samples, the person has to be under arrest. You can't get a breath sample while out on the road. If a breath test result is below 0.08 and you have probable cause to believe the person is impaired by substances other than alcohol, you can request a urine test. Um, with a urine test, you're looking for drugs. If the driver, so basically saying if they're, point zero, if they're below 0.08, but you have probable cause to know that they're impaired by substances other than alcohol because maybe you found uh, paraphernalia or this or that, or maybe when you did the VGN, it came up as potentially maybe a drug, then you request the urine test. If the driver refuses to submit to a urine test, complete a DUI citation and mark the box for refusal. To request a urine sample, the subject must be under physical arrest. Same thing as breath, they have to be under arrest. Uh, we move on to blood test. Um, and remember that section uh, 316 of the Florida Statutes um, gives you information on the breath, the urine, and the blood test. So again, the blood test can be administered if you have reasonable suspicion to believe the person was under the influence of alcohol or a chemical or controlled substance while driving or in actual physical control of the vehicle, or you're unable to conduct a breath test, but it was impractical or impossible. For example, if the driver has an injury on their mouth that prevents them from blowing while taking the breath test, document the reason you cannot administer the breath test. A person does not have to be under arrest for you to request a blood draw under implied consent. So again, urine and breath, they have to be arrested to request that. But with blood, a person does not have to be under arrest for you to request a blood draw under implied consent. We talked about implied consent earlier on in the lesson, um, basically saying that you kind of sign over um, implied consent when you got your license. And again, implied consent, if an officer lawfully arrests a driver for driving or being in actual physical control of a motor vehicle under the influence, the driver must submit to an approved chemical or physical test to determine the alcohol um, presence. And that would be breath, urine, or blood. So you have implied consent. You can get the blood test. Um, you must get a warrant for all blood draws unless there is voluntary consent. So again, a person does not have to be under arrest for you to request a blood draw under implied consent, but you must get a warrant for all blood draws unless there is voluntary consent. All blood draws must occur at a medical facility or in an ambulance for treatment. Only authorized personnel can perform the draw. You are responsible for ensuring that the blood collection follows established procedures by verifying that, one, the blood kit is not expired, two, the blood is collected in the appropriate vial, three, the kit is identified with the driver's name, the date, and the time the blood was collected, as well as the initials of the person who drew the blood. And then um, when you're using a drug recognition expert, um, which I'm going to get to here now, a certified drug recognition expert, DRE, is someone specifically trained to investigate incidents involving drug impaired drivers? That would be a drug recognition expert, a DRE. All right, then our last lesson, which is a page and a half here the DUI packet. Under DUI citation, the DUI citation is for a DUI with an alcohol concentration of 0.08 or higher, or when the driver refused a blood, urine, or breath test after their arrest. Complete the DUI citation the same way as a UTC. The DUI citation is a charging document. This is big here. Remember, the DUI citation is the charging document. And so, again, the DUI citation has the elements of the crime. Um, it has the probable cause. So it's almost like an affidavit in that sense where it is a charging document. The DUI citation is a charging document and required 
and is required to authorize the Department of Highway Safety and Motor Vehicle to suspend the person's driving privilege. If the person has an alcohol concentration of 0.08 or above or refuses a breath urine or blood test, seize their Florida driver's license if it is in their possession and attach it to this copy of the DUI citation. Within five days, forward the Florida license and a copy of it to the Department of Highway Safety and Motor Vehicles for an administrative suspension hearing. Follow agency policies and procedures when issuing a DUI citation. So again, if it's points rate or above or they refuse to do the breath, urine, or blood test, you're taking the driver's license. But remember, this has to be after they're already arrested and you have filled out the DUI citation, you filled out the charging document. Then you move on to the report. The DUI report should establish the following elements for the arrest. There's a bunch of them here. One, two, three, four, five, six of them. There was reasonable suspicion for stopping slash contacting the accused. Obviously, you need that pretext. The accused was the driver or an actual physical control of the vehicle. There was probable cause to believe the accused was impaired. The officer followed lawful procedure regarding the rights of the accused. The officer followed lawful arrest procedures. Subsequent observation and interview of the accused provided additional evidence relevant to the alleged offense. The officer made a lawful request for the accused to submit to the blood, breath, or urine test and the results of the test. Uh, organize the DUI narrative around the total sequence of events, beginning with first observation, and then you continue through the arrest, and then it follows with the end of the incarceration or release of the person. So they want you to go in order of events chronologically with DUI narratives. Um, before I conclude here, I'm going to shout out uh, Jackson, my main man. I'm going to shout out Alamon. I'm going to shout out... Uh, who else am I going to shout out? I'm going to shout out Moss. I'm going to shout out Cajete. I'm going to shout out Dominguez. You my boys. Respect. And that concludes chapter 12. Just kidding. Chapter 13.